Welcome, everybody, to this Bloomberg Television and World Economic Forum discussion in the round. I love this format because it's going to allow us to cross talk and really have a great conversation. We will open up the floor as well to questions. So get your questions uh, going and thinking and raise your hand later when I open up the floor to have a great a discussion. Now, the topic is very, very difficult. The global economic outlook. We can talk just about anything, but we put the question to the Twitter sphere, if you want to call it that, much like Donald Trump does every morning at 3 a.m., the first thing he does is tweet. So we're going to go to the tweet that we sent out to the world, and about 2,000 respondents said, what do you see as the major risk to the global economy now? You can see the results, and our panelists here are the experts who can probably pick up on this. To my left is Helen Ju. Of course, she is BlackRock's MD and head of China Fundamental Equities. Thank you, Helen. Also, we have Rintaro Tamaki, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Zhang Tao, thank you so much for joining us. He is the Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And to my right, we have Professor Tyler Cowan, Professor of Economics at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, I believe. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the response are very interesting. Geoeconomic tensions, the number one major risk to the global economy right now. So that is more than double the next two respondents, uh, responses together. Rising debt burdens, 30%. That's a topic we'll talk about in the Chinese economy. And weak productivity growth, 15%. We can talk about some of the central bank policies as well targeted to that topic. 9% others, those are the people that didn't really have an opinion or thought climate change or Fed or policy overreach or perhaps even cyborgs taking over as our overlords and ruling our last dying days. That's my fear and biggest risk. All right, let's put it to the panelists, ladies and gentlemen, as we begin this discussion in the round. I live in a house with my wife, my daughter, and a female cat, so it's always <laughs> ladies first. <laughs> Helen Ju. Thank you, Steve. And I have four daughters, and so there's a lot of ladies in my house as well. Um, look, I think the respondents hit a really, really good topic, which is the geopolitical or geoeconomic tensions. I absolutely agree that things like productivity and debt burdens are indeed threats to the global economy. But you know these are not things that were built up overnight. They were things that were built up over a number of years. And to some extent, we may even see, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence and other things, technology advancement, offset some of these concerns um, over the medium term. So I do agree that probably the biggest issue to consider is really the geoeconomic issues. And that really brings us back to the unpredictable nature of some of these driving forces. For example, obviously what's happening in North Korea, uh, what's happening in the Middle East, a lot of unexpected things have arisen over the past six to 12 months. And even with that aside, we still have all of Trump's agenda in terms of protectionism and trade wars globally, which fortunately so far haven't really panned out to the extent that he had talked about during the election. Part of that is also related to the fact that perhaps he wants to build some bridges with China to help fix other geopolitical issues. But I think this is really the one issue that's got the least visibility and the biggest risk of potentially spinning out of control within a relatively short period of time. So I absolutely agree that's probably the biggest concern of the markets. All right, that's the second reference to Trump already in the first three minutes. I'm going to keep a running total how many times we mentioned Trump. It's going to be unavoidable, I am afraid. Uh, Tamaki-san, your views on the poll results. I think it is a mixture of feelings. Some say it's a quite short-term imminent threat, for example, from North Korea, Syria, and uh, say political turmoil. But others concerns more about more structural long-term issues like uh, climate change, digitization, aging. These, the, uh, the poll reflects mixed, mixed feelings of the people. And the government has to address both sides once paying attention of imminent threat. The current economic situation at this juncture, it is better than before. The, uh, say perhaps the best timing, best period after the crisis. But uh, the, the issue before the government is how to address 
more structural issues at this critical right. juncture. Mm. You know, imminent threats turn into long-term yes. threats, yes. though, if the yeah. policies are not yeah. uh, enacted yes. appropriately. Yes. Deng, your views on the results, the geopolitical or geoeconomic risks to the uh, global economy? I mean, your questions to you are probably going to be more about the Chinese risks the debt pile, which was, I believe, the second biggest answer and the global respondents. How do you uh, see the biggest risk in the global economy right now? Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Steve. The, um, uh, I saw from the uh, surveys, and I, I partially agree with it, and the, uh, clearly uh, you just named top three, um, but the way I saw it, first of all, the, uh, the outlook we saw at this moment, there's a uh, uh, increasing rooms for cautious, uh, optimistic views for the uh, global economic outlook at this moment. And but of course, the uh, uh, there are risks. Um, the uh, to begin with, the risk in in, in, in uh, from my perspective is the uh, the uncertainties associated associated with the uh, inward looking uh, policies. Protectionism. Um, um, well, that's part of it, um, and uh, and of course the uh, another one is the uh, here mentioned is debt burdens. Uh, in my view, is is part of the financial risks associated with, for example, um, there could be a more than uh, expected uh, uh, rapid rising of the uh, interest rate. Yes. Um, so that's the, uh, the change the, uh, the, the 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 basic pictures. And of course, the, uh, as the survey mentioned, there's a non-economic factors, uh, geopolitical uh, tensions, and so forth. So I think the, um, uh, in the sense that the, uh, um, uh, some of the risk are already covered there, but they, uh, they are maybe a little bit more broader for that. Uh, but, but most of them, it seems to me that the, uh, uh, these are, some of them are short-term risk, some of them are uh, medium-term risk. Um, then they need a different set of the policy mix to respond. We will elaborate more later on. Professor Cowan, from your global perch in Virginia, how do you see it? First, I don't think China is the main risk. In essence, people have been talking about that for too long. And when you have so many years to prepare for a debt problem, it tends to be manageable. The truly bad crises come as big surprises. Number one, I think, by far, is the risk of a cyber attack. And the fact that none of you mentioned it makes me actually think it's a bigger risk. The situation in the Persian Gulf with Qatar and the possibility of an extension of the Saudi-Iran proxy war. Also, the blockade of Qatar is something hardly anyone anticipated. That means we don't have a good model of the situation. When you don't have a good model of the situation, the risk is probably quite high. Third, the interaction between North Korea and President Trump. Yes. The North Korean situation isn't new. But to actually have Trump as president, which I think on the domestic front actually will be OK, even though he is erratic. But in terms of foreign policy, there are a few checks and balances. Uh, we still don't know how to model his temperament. People who know him don't quite know how to model his temperament when he is unconstrained. And how that interacts with the situation when you have South Korea, China, Japan, other parties all doing their bit to push and shove it in different directions. Those, to me, are the three main risks right now. Trump. Three? <laughs> <laughs> you could have called it North Korea, but either way. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, let's pick up on cyber security and cyber threats um, first, because we just had the second ransomware major one after WannaCry, uh, which hit global markets, spread to Asia yesterday. Ishwar Prasad, uh, an economic peer mm -hmm. of yours, of course, from Cornell University and the Brookings Institution, uh, he, we interviewed him on Bloomberg Television. He said there is an underpriced threat right now from cyber terrorism, if you will, and it affects everyone. China has just launched its new cybersecurity law June 1st. You're taking steps as well. How much of a threat to the markets and to the economy, Helen, is well, cyber? I mean, certainly it could be incredibly disruptive, uh, and particularly depending on which area the cyber attacks target. Um, could have totally different impacts in terms of the markets, for sure. Um, whether it actually affects the outlook of the global economy over the medium to longer term, I think, is another question mark. But certainly, the disruption in terms of near-term stability, uh, maybe you know, bringing balls 
back up pretty significantly from a very, very low level. I think those types of impacts are quite likely should there be more of a cyber attack. Uh, I think the key issue here is that people will have very little sense of how to deal with it, how to contain it, and whether it recurs again next time and in what format. So I think those types of issues would certainly increase the risk premium across all asset classes and bring some short-term disruption uh, to people's confidence regarding at least the cyclical aspects, if not necessarily the structural aspects over the medium term. Does the OECD look at the risk profile of the global economy as it relates to cybercrime? Do you, do you drill into that? Yes, I say we are so much worried about it. Um, the, in, term, say, in terms of financial markets, we have, of course, some traditional established markets like a stock exchange, um, bond markets, but we are pushing financial, risk, financial risks outside our conventional markets. Say many insurance companies, many institutional investors, others are taking risks. So we are quite concerned about the dysfunctioning, dysfunctioning of those players outside traditional, conventional um, market participants. Mm. The new cybersecurity law, some of the concerns within the international community is that it would be used to perhaps benefit domestic corporations um, and also maybe you, know, you have to store your servers on shore. There are a lot of concerns, but also it shows that China can bolster and strengthen their defenses against this type of global attack. Yeah, I think the uh, the cyber uh, securities um, is has been caught increasingly attentions around the world, um, including here in China. Um, I think these people had a very good reason uh, to do that. Um, from uh, our perspective, the IMF, um, it has serious implications of financial stabilities, and also things like the. Uh, 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 efforts of anti-money laundering or uh, a counter of uh, terrorist financing uh, effort. So I think the, uh, uh, these are new, but not brand new, but has been, like you said, the, uh, uh, people are trying to uh, you know, get the experiences, try to make a best use of it, how, what is the best practice, how to coordinate across the, you know, the borders. Um, these are the things uh, I think is coming out at different uh, forums. And of course, the, uh, all the member countries uh, progressed in different ways um, the, uh, uh, the national levels. Um, um, but I think the more, more and more importantly, I, um, how the international community would address uh, these issues uh, at the multilateral level. Um, the, uh, uh, so IMF is working on that. The, uh, particularly, uh, our work is the, uh, closely associated with uh, the, w the work on, on the fintech, fintech mm. the, uh, the uh, uh, how to, you know, uh, associated with the uh, uh, application of the new technologies, uh, blockchains, this type of things. So I think the, uh, um, uh, we're working on it, and hopefully we can work together, uh, like I said, the, uh, the, with the multilateral efforts. Well, fintech is a fascinating subject in itself that is both disruptive and also provides great opportunity as well. I think it was the Boston Consulting Group out with a report recently that says the average Chinese adult today has five financial accounts, many of them being whether it's WeChat, finance, Ant Financial from Alibaba or others. I don't even have five financial <laughs> accounts. It's amazing what is happening. But there's also a lot of risk associated with what some had said has been an under-regulated, which is not a bad thing, some would argue as well, an under-regulated um, uh, industry where you have Ponzi schemes like Ezubao bilking $7.6 billion from people. Uh, how much of a risk and how much of an opportunity are we seeing right now in fintech? The word Ponzi scheme and the word innovation, they're actually remarkably close concepts. <laughs> <laughs> so I see China as being in a highly innovative moment right now, financially more innovative than the United States. It's striking to me, I can now go to a serious restaurant in say a second or third tier city in China and they won't take my credit card, not because they're backward, but because they've leapfrogged me and in essence they want other more efficient payment media. I do think wealth management products in China 
are too risky and something there will blow up. I suspect it can be contained. I think there's a resiliency and a kind of rigidity to the Chinese system where explosions get localized that a lot of outsiders don't understand. But from the consumer fintech side, I don't think there'll be major problems here. Yeah, as part of that Boston Consulting Group survey as well, they found less than 1% of adults have credit cards here. And that's something we've always seen as well. How in the, uh, the equity markets and the financial markets are you seeing the impact and going forward, since this is an outlook discussion, how do you see fintech playing? Well, it's definitely an area of phenomenal growth. Indeed, it brings risk because it's something new that people haven't necessarily experienced previously. But I would guess that 99% of people sitting in this room who have used WeChat payment or Alipay um, probably feel like it's really made their lives easier and it's made it much more convenient. I think the way that we live today versus three to five years ago is evolving very rapidly in China, mostly for the better. Of course, there are risks associated, but I think in Premier Li's inclusive growth speech that he made two days ago, he made it very clear that China needs to be more open-minded on innovation mm -hmm. and to accept that there will be risks and consequences that come with it and just react to it afterwards rather than to not nurture the innovation in the first place. Um, and I think, you know, one time I had a chat with a friend of mine in uh, one, one of the regulators in China, and uh, I said, well, this has happened. How come you guys haven't responded? And he said, look, our organization only has 25,000 people. And I said, 25,000? That's a lot of people. <laughs> he said, but we're working against the innovation of 1.3 billion people who are you know, making up new business models and trying to do things differently every single day. So of course, we can only respond after these things have come out and have gotten bigger, and then we react to see what should be allowed and what needs to be regulated better. So I think regulators have to you know, act in that way across the board, and I think you know, innovation and fintech is definitely going to be a huge force making our lives for the better, and hopefully um, we can contain the risks appropriately at, uh, at the right juncture. Tamaki san, how much more innovative does the Japanese financial system need to be? When I lived there in the mid 90s, no offense, but everyone called it Byzantine banking. Mm. ATMs closed at 3 p.m., right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and probably seven people handled the little tray if you wanted to make a deposit or a withdrawal going to the counter. How, how far have we come in innovation in Japan? Of course, the situation is now better than <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago. Um, Fintech has sort of similar aspects. One is like a chicken and egg. Innovation creates Fintech. And Fintech is more flexible, more positive in supporting financially the innovation as compared to based on the conventional banking sector. Perhaps in, a, uh, in terms of Japan, um, imminent threat is in banking industry and in mm. insurance industry. Their business model is now becoming quickly obsolete. And uh, they have a huge presence in the economy. And uh, their relevance is losing. And they have to reshuffle, restructure their banking structure. But uh, this is a quite regulated industry. So it is, for the foreseeing for future, it, is, it would be a quite difficult time, hard time, for banking industry and regulators how to adjust fintech. While we're talking about banking and the potential for a banking crisis, if you go to New York, you might hear a lot more talk about the risks in China's banking system and what we don't know that's off book or off balance sheet or at the municipal level and in the wealth management products, what is, how bad the potential underlying assets are. From your perch as the former PBOC official and now at the IMF, <laughs> how would you see the risk to the Chinese banking system right now? Well, the, um, I just made the, the, uh, the comments on uh, what is the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the main uh, risks around the world is the, the financial risks. Um, certainly, that's related to um, some of the, uh, the risks in the financial sectors um, uh, <coughs> everywhere. Um, this is include, um, for example, in Europe, uh, the, the, uh, the balance sheet problems of the banks um, and, and some of the other uh, emerging uh, market as well. But here, yes, um, we saw the uh, increasing um, larger amount of the off-balance sheet activities uh, in the Chinese uh, the financial market. 
and IMF just had the, uh, uh, the most recent uh, FSAP, we call it, the financial sector uh, 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 um, um, stability uh, um, assessment, which is the run every five years for major economies, uh, which is uh, at right now at the very late stage, and soon will the report will be you know, the, uh, discussed at the board and then published. Um, so, as you pointed out, that the uh, uh, there's the um, uh, the risk build up uh, from there, and th there might be because of many reasons. Um, but I think this is, um, 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 in our view, um, is that the in general this is um, uh, something happened uh, accumulated uh, during the last. Uh, 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 five to ten years, and partially related to uh, the effort to overcome the uh, global financial crisis, mm -hmm. and, and and also related to some of the issues uh, with local um, uh, government uh, uh, financing vehicles. Right. Um, so these are very much uh, already um, uh, well elaborated in. Um, not only the, uh, the, uh, the AFSAP, and also included in our most recently concluded the Article 4 uh, uh, consultations with our uh, Chinese counterparts. From your, so, from, from your view, though, is this deleveraging campaign that we're in now, does it run the risk of possibly overshooting and ruining the stability that has been created right now? That is, we have a sort of a lasting holding pattern on the recovery right now in the Chinese economy, allowing authorities to push forward with their deleveraging campaign ahead of the party Congress. Do you see that this could potentially be a drag on growth further, though? Well, I think the, uh, the deleveraging uh, issues has been discussed uh, in, in many places, and we also pay closer attention to that. Um, in general, uh, uh, this deleveraging, um, and you see there are different types of the uh, deleveraging across different sectors, uh, public sectors, uh, corporate sectors. Um, then overall, people are um, trying to address these issues very carefully, um, try to make a balance on one hand to um, really uh, take off those, uh, the, uh, the credits, uh, which is wrong, like you said, the, uh, the maybe excessive uh, a credit uh, in some of the uh, uh, sectors, uh, particularly in the corporate sectors. Uh, and, and on the other hand, they have to maintain to make sure um, there's the adequate uh, support to first restructuring process and also mm. adequate support to the so some of the social sectors. So it's a balancing game. <laughs> Right, and again, we've all talked and heard about the bifurcation of the Chinese economy, or there's probably even divided up more than just in two halves. There's the new economy and the services, which Li Keqiang talked about accounting for more than 50% of GDP now. But there's these old state-owned enterprises as well, and there's overcapacity issues in steel and coal and the zombie companies, if you will. What is the risk? You said China is not the biggest global risk, but there must be underlying risk if China does go on to prolonged issue, resolving the issues that are underlying. There's a productivity risk for China, even in the medium term, much less the long run, and much of that comes from the state-owned enterprises. Think of China, the country, as actually a big burst of fiscal policy, and most of all that goes through the SOEs, and that makes the Chinese economy in some way remarkably robust. But you keep on doing that, you keep on doing that, you invest 48% or even 50% of GDP. It's hard to get that right for so many years on end. And when you're doing simpler things, we need a road, we need a bridge, we need high-speed rail, it's not that hard to get it right. Yeah. But you're now more and more at margins where the potential for decision quality decay is higher. I'm not convinced how much China actually has deleveraged so far. I'm very familiar with all the claims that it's going on, but things actually seem to be going too well to believe that there's been a lot of deleveraging. So I would focus on the What's the actual timing of deleveraging when you look behind the rhetoric? I think we don't know, at least I don't know, but I see that as the key variable for China right now. Moody's downgraded China's debt. What impact? China kind of shrugged that off. 
What yeah, I, I think that has very little with a delever no? to do with a deleveraging process. Um, effectively, China has very little external debt exposure, so you know it's it's negative for sentiment. But in reality, it doesn't really hurt the economy in a meaningful way. The way that it might hurt some other countries, let's say within emerging markets, that have a significant amount of reliance on external debt. Um, but I think the deleveraging process, just as we just talked about, really hasn't really begun in a meaningful way. The definition would really be that credit growth is slower than nominal GDP growth. We probably got close to that in the first quarter of this year because nominal GDP growth was in the low teens and credit growth was probably a similar number. But I don't think the policymakers have come out and said they need to achieve deleveraging this year for the economy as a whole. The objective is really to take out some of the financial sector risks in the near term yeah. and then focus on corporate deleveraging over the medium term. Just corporate deleveraging, that means the government and households, which still have relatively low well, leverage, yeah. could still lever up. And indeed, some of the fiscal reforms have shifted some of the corporate debt burden over to the public sector over time, for example. But if we're looking at the outlook, I mean, the underlying issues is reform. We must push forward with the underlying structural problems in the Chinese economy. And we can use the municipal, uh, the local governments as one example, uh, corporates is another, but the local municipalities have a huge restructuring issue for raising finances and, and not being able to sell bonds directly and going to the LGFVs, the local government financing vehicles, and we don't know the extent. How much of a risk is a crisis at the municipal level? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm looking well, at you. <laughs> okay. The, uh, I think you touch upon the uh, very uh, uh, crucial areas uh, here. Uh, certainly, um, the um, accelerations of the reforms is very much needed here, um, which we believe at the IMF that that will be very much useful and helpful to sustain the economies uh, in the uh, in the in, in the a more appropriate levels of the, uh, the growth. Um, but looking at the uh, different areas, different levels, uh, uh, municipalities, and so forth, um, so these are uh, the areas people are working on it for uh, quite a bit uh, uh, time, period. Um, and I, I, the, uh, for example, the, uh, the, there has been the, the reforms going on between uh, the central local fiscal relationship um, try to address these uh, this problems, and they, you can go on and on. There are many dimensions sure. uh, the, uh, in terms of the, uh, how to set up the, uh, the debt limit, uh, how to finance the municipality. Debt for equity the, swaps. Uh, exactly, exactly. So these are the things going on uh, uh, for a while, and it seems like the, uh, the, it's working uh, uh, to some extent. Do we have a risk, though, of a local municipality defaulting? We're having rising defaults on the corporate side, which it seems as though the government is allowing that. But is there a risk of defaults at the municipal level, or is that just out of the question? I think, in, on average, or in 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 in, in, a, in a overall um, ways, uh, I don't think that's that's a case. Um, but you have to look at the issues uh, uh, case by case, yeah. uh, different uh, the uh, 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 locations by different locations. Uh, Sure. would be different, the situation. It's not one economy here. Exactly. Yes. That's the default. It's yeah. not always so well defined in these situations. Right. I think that's a key point. How do you mean? The law is not clear on financial matters in the way it would be in the United States, where you have a lot of experience with municipal and other defaults. And anything that might be a default, you can call not a default and actually be within <laughs> You this mean kick the can down the road or swept under the rug? Something, whatever you need to do. Cram something down someone's throat and all of a sudden it's not a default. Yeah. Build another business park or bridge or stadium, though, that is not having any cash flow and they can't service the debt. I've seen it all across China, these projects that are not gaining any way to service their debt. Are we... Am I seeing something different? Well, well, I think you know this issue was actually um, discussed by the regulators a couple of years ago. In effect, the LGFEs were set up with relatively unsustainable structures, right. whereby you have a potentially a social project that was in a corporate 
entity that didn't necessarily have legal relationship to the local government and so on and so forth. But since then, a very sweeping local government financing and fiscal reform sure. has already happened. Yeah. And we've been doing significant um, work in terms of seeing the government do uh, local government debt swaps, swapping from the LGFE format into the bond issuances that we have seen. So we're talking about trillions per year of debt swaps with new structures that are more sustainable, with better matching of duration with a project, separating the projects that have cash flows and the projects that will never have cash flows, and linking the projects that never have cash flows with other sources of fiscal income, doing multi-year fiscal budgeting to ensure that there is uh, some way of servicing the interest payments as well as the principal. So I think the way that the government has handled this whole local government debt refinancing is potentially the blueprint for other types of uh, reforms within the financial sector where you address the flow first to make sure the incremental isn't low quality and unsustainable and then gradually you start to digest and swap or alter the stock to diffuse the risk further. So I think we'll continue to see that model used to similar effective outcomes. Then how transformative will the new bond connect uh, be on the Chinese economy as far as attracting foreign investment foreign inflows into the bond market here in China, which is what, about $10 trillion, the third largest in the world. It's surpassed the UK. Japan's the next one in the United States. Do you see that attraction of foreign investment and foreign money into the bond market helping take a little bit of the pressure off an economy that is so over leveraged? I think the Bond Connect has to be considered in a structural manner, not just as a short-term cyclical impact. It's definitely a very momentous step forward, and I think it's something that China needs to do sooner or later in terms of financial sector and capital account opening reforms. Um, that said, even though we do believe that the, stock connect, the Bond Connect will be announced fairly imminently, um, we don't think that the amount of inflows in the very beginning are going to be substantial right. in terms of having meaningful impact on the overall economy and environment in China. And that comes from a number of factors, like, for example, the fact that a lot of people globally still feel that renminbi will depreciate. And therefore, even though you get slightly higher yields in China, maybe it's offset by the FX risk that people perceive. It also comes from structural factors, like people feel like maybe the rating agencies aren't as uh, fully developed, or maybe there isn't a proper um, debt pricing um, you know, developed or in action in the Chinese domestic corporate bond markets. And therefore, people feel like if we don't really know whether you're getting paid for the risk, then they don't necessarily want to participate. But I think all of these things will be resolved over time with more structural reform and more advancement um, of the systems. So I think over the medium to longer term, the debt market opening up will have tremendous implications, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it all happens together on day one. Since we're talking about the outlook, I mean, Obviously, the ratings agencies have come into question here, whereas a, a corporate issuance uh, by one ratings agency might be down here, but another one might give it a, a triple A rating. And transparency is an issue, um, is it not, for the, the development of the Chinese corporate bond market and attracting foreigners? I would step back and make a larger point. There's a lot of countries, when you look at the ratio of debt to income or GDP, it appears unsustainable. But I think that's the wrong comparison. If you look at the ratio of debt to national wealth, which is typically six to eight times higher than GDP, then pretty much always, including for Japan, that number is entirely manageable. So I would ask the political economy question, is this nation capable of somehow mobilizing its wealth to address its debt problems? For China and Japan, I think the answer ultimately is yes. So you may see messiness but a crisis where things collapse and implode, I think for that reason. Now, you look at Greece, which in some ways their debt numbers are just like China's, but Greece cannot take the wealth it has and in some way pull it out and use it to pay off its debts, and perhaps neither can Italy. But that's the way to think about these, is not just the flows, but converting the stock into the flow. But why couldn't Japan do that? The, uh, in terms of macroeconomic sustainability, he may be right, the professor may be right. The uh, Japan accumulated wealth as compared to the accumulated debt, so it is manageable. But uh, the issue is more uh, intergenerational. Almost a quite substantial part of assets, financial assets, are held by aged people. Yep. And in the future, younger generation has to pay back such kind of accumulated debt, particularly uh, public debt. 
This is an issue of uh, intergenerational distribution of burden. But someone mm. inherits those securities, right? Mm. Mm. So you inherit, the, if you're the younger generation, you inherit those liabilities, but you also inherit the assets. Yes, but uh, the situation is, it's a such kind of extremely aged society. Inheritance happened from 95 years old to 65 years old, never coming down to working age. So inheritance does not solve the problem. The behind the uh, accumulated debt in local municipality in China, we should see uh, the distribution of tax revenue between central government and local governments. Local municipalities, in particular, has no stable revenue sources to finance their, their needs. So perhaps, and I say, after successful reform of VAT in China, local tax reform is quite urgent. How key is the consumer in China? BCG, again, Boston Consulting Group, out with a report saying the consumption boom will add about $1.8 trillion uh, to the economy uh, by 2021. One of the problems in Japan has been the, the household savings. They keep it under the kotatsu. They're not spending. <laughs> they're, they're worried about their future. There's no yeah. social safety net. Yes. But China is trying to get people to unlock their closet and bring out their money. Yeah, well, you see the, uh, there's a continuous progress in terms of um, moving towards uh, domestic uh, uh, demand, including the consumptions. Um, but the, uh, we have to uh, realize that the, uh, the consumption behaviors uh, related to many other issues, uh, policies, regulatories, and also cultural, um, the, uh, the, the Asian societies, things. Um, what I, what I see this the, the way is the, um, uh, very much related, related to how to make sure you can uh, make the, uh, the increasing of consumptions on a sustainable basis, which is the productivity issues. Mm -hmm. And that's related to which, which we just talked about it, the uh, demographic uh, 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 changes. The, yeah. um, the Asians. Uh, um, particularly East Asia, uh, the, the society has become uh, aging uh, rapidly. Um, and, 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 and more importantly, uh, they become aging as a whole um, before they uh, getting uh, rich. Uh, right. so, um, so you have people have numbers on it. And that certainly highlight the, uh, the issues how to build up the, 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 the public, the fiscal uh, buffers. Uh, to support, uh, you know, the next generation things, the, 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 including these consumption issues. Professor Cowan, how yeah. big an issue is, and this is longer term, I mean, yes. we've been talking short term, the, the next couple of years, but demographics with the aging population in Japan, the aging population in China and elsewhere, where people putting off having babies, they're career minded, how big an issue is this as we start losing 20, 30 years down the road from now, people of working age? Maybe it's become a little overrated as a problem, especially for China. If you think here how early so many people retire, there's a lot more effective labor force participation you could get just by fixing how retirement is done. And then if you ask, well, people in rural areas who could move to urbanized areas and be much more productive, how much more of that is left in the system in China? Uh, again, hard to say, but I think actually quite a bit over some time. So, Labor force effectiveness, I think, in China will be much better than just the age numbers or the TFR numbers look. Uh, Japan is somewhat different. They've already had significant gains in getting women to work more. They're now ahead of the United States in this regard, which is great for them. But the problem with success is that it can be harder to have a bit more success. But fiscally, Japan seems to me sustainable. They have a low rate of price inflation. They can monetize when they need to. What's even government debt, a zero coupon bond, or money in the Japanese system can be blurred as much as they need to do. And you know, per capita, their productivity is OK, maybe not spectacular. And they can kind of glide into a lower population, low everything in terms of rates. But pretty good lives would be my best sense of Japan. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that kind of achievements, coziness, is a concern, source of concern. <laughs> <laughs> Status quo is, I say, people have uh, two mixed feelings. One is they appreciate the current, current quality of life, status quo. So they want to maintain 
the lifestyle, business model, everything. But on the other hand, say they are looking at the risks in the future, are aging, and uh, globalization, digitization, decarbonization, everything has to start now to address those structural issues. So it's a mixed feelings in Japan, say this, say stability is not necessarily a good word for Japan. Right, because we've had these years of Abenomics and where are we now? Yeah. And Governor Kuroda will be stepping down. Do we get a whole new approach? We've had zero interest rates, we've had Abenomics, we're nowhere close to the inflation target that yes, they want. Yes, we have, perhaps and we have overcome deflation. De deflation, deflation. De deflation yes. is on a say achievements, but I say the, the issue is making use of this opportunity. The uh, the government and the society has to step up our efforts to address the future issues. How about the United States economy? We'll talk about that briefly before I open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, reflating the Trump bump. There's number five for Trump. <laughs> Um, seems to be petering out a little bit. I know the IMF was out recently with a, not a downgrade of the United States, but a down, a lower outlook for growth, basically taking out the prospect for stimulus, meaning tax cuts, because we haven't gotten really a plan yet, and also infrastructure stimulus. I, is, and then at the same time, we're on a, a tightening cycle at the Fed. Where, what, what's your outlook for the US economy and as it relates to what the Fed might do, because unemployment is, it gives you the argument that perhaps they will go tighter on tightening, right? Well, uh, more cuts, uh, more hikes, or against a uh, sluggish uh, inflation picture. One of my heresies is I think that what the Fed does now doesn't matter very much. Uh, if you think about the White House, I think Trump as a domestic president is highly ineffective and on any policy, foreign or domestic, there are three or four different points of view, which are the administration policy, and they simply coexist and float together. And this already is sapping consumer confidence, just as our allies are worried, people are postponing investment decisions, because they realize we have a government with three or four different views in it, which never seem to get resolved, and probably most things won't get done. Now, that's not the end of the world. American business, in some ways, is still pretty spectacular. But I see confidence ebbing and uncertainty increasing and a slow dribbling away of the advantages we had from the recovery. And I think there'll be some slowing. The Fed will be moderate. And uh, maybe I'm slightly pessimistic. Biggest problem is long-run productivity. Our best companies are tremendous, but there's just too many companies in America that are seeing zero productivity growth. Your daily blog is the marginal revolution, That's right. right? Your latest book, I'm going to plug you here, Average is Over. Powering America Beyond the Age of Great Stack. Complacent is there a new one too? just out, yes. All right, what's that one? About how <laughs> Americans don't take enough risk right now. Really? Yes. Because you also said the, the kind of the summation of that last book is if you're not at the top in the United States, you're at the bottom. We are mm -hmm. losing a middle class. This is true of many countries. The problem of not taking enough risk is common with Japan, as was said before. It's not a problem here in China. You know, if you do not take risk, risk will come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's stressful, but it's also very useful. But I think most of Western Europe, Japan, and much of the United States have this problem of complacency and just getting by, and life is good enough that on any given day you can do not very much and in the short run, it's fine. In the long run, it's very worrying. You actually increase your aggregate risk. That's my worry about Japan, too. Yeah, totally. Agree. Very you, similar. You called Mr. Abe brave. You called uh, Mr. Kuroda brave, or at least brave policies, when you and I talked in February of last year. But do they need to take more risk? He, they, the Abenomics, Abe administration, and uh, Governor Kuroda took uh, quite a brave action to overcome defra de defra to de against deflation, yeah. and they achieved partially, so partial success. And uh, the, we are staying afloat in such a uh, not so bad, not so good situation. But uh, the, um, my point is to step up their brevity, brave, say braveness, to reform, to advance the reform to prepare the future of Japanese society, uh, to increase on productivity, <coughs> increase uh, say, how to address and uh, a further aging society, to change the structure of the society is uh, quite an essential and imminent issue. But uh, 
the current situation is too cozy for everyone. Right. Mm. I want to open up the floor to questions, so let's get the microphones going around while we're getting uh, the microphones here right in front, if you have a question. And please, everybody, keep the questions to one short question. We're on television. Very fast. Um, what's your opinion on uh, the banking industry in uh, Europe and about the European outlook? We've not spoke about uh, Europe, so I'd like to listen about that. Yeah, my fault there. The ECB, of course, we had Mario Draghi uh, saying he sees room to pare back stimulus. Uh, Europe seems to be on a path of recovery. Uh, despite all the noise that we seem to dominate in the media about Brexit and the like, and of course the, the bubbling potential troubles again in Southern Europe in the banking system, but Europe, anyone want to tackle that one? You know, in my view, there'll never be a truly effective banking union in the European Union. The differential treatments of the bailouts in Spain and Italy shows this quite markedly. It will end up as every nation on its own with aid at the edges to smooth over, smooth over the biggest bumps. I think that's okay, actually. Uh, you know, the Germans and other Northern European countries, they understand that banking union is indirectly fiscal union, and they have to bail out those other governments through their banks. The bank, the government, fiscally, it's ultimately the same thing. So the mess that we know is the European Union. Life there is still good, but I think it can continue for a long time in a kind of low growth stability and I think that's what we're seeing. Voters will always be unhappy, but there's not really any other, pl other place for them to go. Here. Yeah. My, my question is on productivity growth or the lack of it. Um, despite all the new technologies, digital, AI, and all of that, we yesterday heard from Professor Corwin, for example, about the decline in productivity in some countries and yes. less than 1% in most countries, except China, I think. So why has this not flown through? And would we see somewhere this flowing through in the next X years? What's your view? Do you want to pick okay, this up? I, th I think that's an excellent question. The, we see uh, technology advances at the same time. We see uh, the uh, productivity growth is declining. And there must be a reasons. And people are actually struggling to find out the reasons. Um, the way I saw it, uh, there could be. One is the aging, um, because the, uh, uh, there are some studies saying that when people reach to a certain age of the limit, then the productivity, innovations, uh, is coming down. But that, that can be debatable. But the, uh, that's one of the reasons. Uh, but another reason is the, um, the, the declining of the trade. Um, the, the ratio of the trade growth to GDP growth is about half. Um, since the uh, financial crisis. So with the trade going down, the innovation is coming, you know, the, uh, uh, also um, uh, will not contribute too much to the pr pr uh, productivity growth. So the, the main things to me is we have to maintain the, uh, uh, the, the openness um, to, in order to, you know, promote the, the trade. Um, so Back to the uh, the theme of this uh, the uh, the summer uh, summer summer Davos, then innovation is the themes we have to uh, push forward to promote innovations so that the openness the trade can be reintegrated. Uh, that's the key to maintain the uh, uh, to bring back the uh, productivity. Instead of innovation in isolation, protectionism and those sentiments, border taxes. What does that do to the root of his question? Another aspect of uh, productivity is divergence between quite limited number of high productivity company, leading companies, and the rest. So the issue is, one of the issue is diffusion, diffusion of new technology to other, other parts of the society. You are discussing the average productivity Sluggish, sluggish, but uh, the reality is small number of high end and large number of low end. So, how to integrate this divergence is a quite difficult issue. But I say this is really, really challenge for the policymakers. More questions? Back here. Sorry, those behind me. I can't see you. <laughs> You'll be next. 
Okay. Uh, you have discussed the perspectives for Japan, China, US, Europe. Uh, let me ask you, what do you think about perspectives and role in the global economic outlook for Russia? Ah, Russia, who wants to tackle that one? Professor? My wife was <laughs> born and grew up in Moscow, so I hear about this every day. And what I hear is so unremittingly negative, I feel I'm not objective. It seems to me Russia has incredible human talent and potential, but there's some political problem there which seems to be perpetual. And that Russia politically has some of the worst aspects of kind of 17th century Asian corrupt clan systems, and it still hasn't gotten out of them. So until that happens, I suppose I'm pessimistic. But again, I'm really not objective. My father-in-law, he lives with us. He listens to Russian radio half the day. And then he comes and he talks to me about it. Uh, there ought to be a better way to use all that human talent. But the fact that it hasn't happened yet, we have to somehow take seriously. And again, the news media, which I'm a part of, tends to again recycle the issues between the allegations between Trump and the Russians, <laughs> and it, it, it becomes a self-perpetuating noise cycle in, in some ways. But uh, from my understanding, I'm not an expert on the Russian economy, but the Russian economy seems to be picking up a little bit, but there is the threat, though, of more sanctions coming from the US Senate, I believe. So I hope we discussed a little bit of Russia. Back here, this gentleman. Uh, let's fast forward to 2030. Do you think the quality of life of more people would be better or worse? And if it will be better, what do you think uh, those factors would be? Because from what I'm hearing, political leadership, innovation, um, and all the climate just points to a very iffy economic outlook at present. So how, what does the future look like? 2030, anybody want to look into the crystal ball? Mm. <laughs> 2030, that's a long <laughs> time for China. You know, the. Um, Obviously, I, uh, I believe and I'm confident that by uh, 2030s, life will be better uh, right now. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Um, first of all, the, uh, we're talking about productivities, but the, I'm sure it is, uh, where, when the policies was uh, more appropriately uh, put into place, then that productivity will come back. And I, I believe the, uh, the, uh, either the policy makers or uh, private sectors uh, which is uh, underpinned by the uh, strong entrepreneurship, which these days we're talking about, that will all support the, uh, the uh, make the economy grow further. And more importantly, these days, people after the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the financial crisis, and particularly during the last couple of years, people realize that we have to make sure the growth can benefit for a uh, large and larger uh, uh, portion of the population so that the, peop uh, the population can gain the wider uh, based uh, support to uh, moving forward in, tr in, in terms of the, uh, particularly the openness. So I think if, as long as we, we put all, the, all of these efforts in, in, in one direction and make it the effort more in a more coordinated way, we will be uh, uh, successful to reach that which means we, we have a better life in the future. But, but I think you know, the one point that I wanted to add is that whether life is better in 2030 kind of depends on what we do from now until, let's say, 2022, 2025. If we choose the easier path, which is no reforms, but we kind of keep the status quo and keep kicking the can down the road, I think that means potentially by 2030, life won't be as good as it is today. If we're willing to actually take some risks and implement a lot of the changes that have been talked about on this panel, whether it's in terms of pension reforms in China and hukou reforms or in Europe, a lot of the um, very difficult challenges that haven't yet been addressed or pushed through in a number of peripheral countries, if we can address these in a very decisive manner in the next three to five years, we have a very bright outlook for 2030. Uh, Those do we, things look good in South Asia. We've barely mentioned that. Pakistan also. It's a lot of people. So be optimistic. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I wanted to get a pulse here. Uh, we have four people on the panel here. Do we have more optimists or pessimists here? Do we have more of a chance to have another global financial crisis by 2030? Or will the protectionist walls be somehow chipped away and we'll have a more integrated global economy in 2030? Of course, I'm on the more optimistic side. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. No, I'm not really sure. I mean, you have a beautiful, yes. I mean, we have past experiences for years. 
uh, we are human beings. We have enough, uh, you know, wisdom to overcome the challenges. Yes, I agree with. We, we have a lot of challenges. Those risks we're talking about, um, but we will, you know, uh, get through. Um, uh, just speaking of this, uh, uh, the, you know, the uh, industrial revolutions. We have 4.0 all the way through 1.0, 2.0 until now. Each and every time people get scared and, and each and every time we, we, we went through all the way coming down to here, a lot of crisis uh, when the financial system become much more complicated. Yes, we have a problem. But people we'll in the public, there. they're dissatisfied. Some of them are. We saw it in the United States. You talked about the erosion of the middle class. We saw the people in the middle England. They voted Brexit. Uh, there is protectionist sentiment in the parts of Europe as well. Marine Le Pen was almost elected. There's populism on the move, on the march. How do we conquer that if that's what we truly want in this society? Is a glo I, I would assume this audience are global, globalization advocates. So how do we overcome the protectionist sentiments and getting those who feel left behind onto the Gravy train, very short, are. very short. You have to show people the globalizations uh, can work. So that's that's how and that's why we are focused on. And not, I believe they will. Not discussing globalization is good or bad. The question for before the policymakers uh, how we can make globalization work for yeah. all. So we have many, many issues to mm. make globalization work for all. And I say, in that sense, we policymakers, as an instinct or as a duty, we have to make, we, we are optimistic to see the future world. Because and I say, we are working to make a world of the, say, the bright. I've been told we have one minute. Quick question. <laughs> right here. Uh, um, Austin O'Carey is my name. Uh, pick question to the, the, the issue of the, middle class and those that are left, middle class disappearing and those that are left uh, behind. It, supposing we change the, the mindset a bit, because what we have now is um, deep capitalism that is, seems to be, to be built on extreme greed. What if we change it so that a billionaire is someone that touched a billion lives that has a billion dollars in assets? Thereby, what we're measuring is impact rather than accumulation to keep. Will that work in this new dispensation? You mean encouraging philanthropy or what? No philanthropy, but really uh, investments in social, that, that are social in nature, but still profitable. Elon Musk, things, yes. things like that. Yes. Uh, well, we, see, we hear it from Jack Ma, we hear it from others who are trying to promote this type of uh, investment. Ellen, do you have any views on this? Or? Look, I think policymakers globally are trying to push for these types of further endeavors. Um, I think that if you look back to the last 10 years, we've had a very tumultuous period in the global economy, sometimes when the pie is not necessarily getting bigger. Uh, people fight over the pie, and it becomes harder. And some people end up getting a bigger slice, and some people end up getting a smaller slice. Um, what we're seeing now is, fingers crossed, the first more synchronized global cyclical recovery period in basically since 2010. And under that scenario, since everything's very much interlinked, if we continue to see good momentum and pragmatic approaches to managing economies and not making irrational decisions towards um, you know, non-inclusive types of growth, then I do think we can keep this virtuous feedback loop going and over the coming years keep making the pie bigger. And once the pie becomes bigger, it becomes easier to share with everybody involved versus the kind of situation we've had to deal with in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope we tackled the global economic outlook. <laughs> it's a big topic. One word from each of you, optimist or pessimist? Optimistic. Optimism. Optimistic, of course. Optimism. I'm a pessimist. I'm a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone.